Welcome to everyone in our audience. Great to have you here. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome Becky Quammen. Becky is co-founder and CEO of Health ITQ and president of Quammen Healthcare Consultants. Welcome, Becky. Great to have you today. Well, thank you, Mark. Great to be here. Absolutely. There's so much to talk about these days. We could talk forever, <laughs> but we're going to talk a little bit about some of the core health IT challenges that patient care organizations are facing right now. And um, even that we could talk about forever. Um, what, starting at 40,000 feet up, let's talk about what's going on right now in terms of health IT, especially uh, regarding the current state of EHR upgrades and replacements um, and how that's impacting staffing and budgets and other emerging issues. It's, it feels like a particularly challenging moment because of the pandemic, uh, but also it feels as though we're in an interesting um, kind of headspace, the entire industry in terms of where do we go next and what, what have we learned now that we've all been implemented sometimes multiple times and most organizations have done some level of EHR optimization. So what, let's start at 40,000 feet and drill down by uh, uh, quantities of 5,000. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, we, if we can get off of 40,000 feet with that question, it'll be, we'll be lucky, but um, it obviously is a very challenging time. Um, we and our world have done a number of implementations through the pandemic where we had to be very creative and work with partners and other folks in the industry to even deliver those implementations. Um, training being particularly challenging and not being able to have access and then staffing shortages and physician issues and access. So, so certainly the pandemic has affected us that way. But um, you know, my, my angst in the industry right now on this particular topic is how much we are revisiting the EHRs that we're continuing to make investments with without measurable outcomes and success factors. Um, for me, it's pretty practical. I've been at this a long time and it's orders, results, charges, documentation of care and access um, to data. And so, so we, keep, we keep doing upgrades, we keep merging, we keep doing different things that cause us to invest and distract from other things in the industry that we should be doing for our organizations. Um, I think it's a sad moment from that perspective. And then, you know, with recent changes in the industry with Oracle purchasing Cerner, there's yet another version of, of, of the perspective that we'll have. Um, I've been around long enough to see all of the other major in, um, corporations purchase the other major players in this industry. And we all know the outcomes of some of those things. So it'll be interesting to see the play there and what happens with data and what happens with where we're going. In, in my world, roughly two thirds, and I was contemplating this and, and thinking about it before our conversation, I think, I think it's safe to say roughly two thirds of every implementation we've done over the last decade since meaningful use came into being and PI is now you know, replacing MU, um, they have either deinstalled, replaced, failed to upgrade, fail to deploy to every unit in the organization because of user experience and user you know, distractions or other competing factors. And then the pandemic piled onto that didn't help. So um, I look back on our client base and I see many of those hospitals have disappeared. Many have merged with other people. Many are dangling aside other organizations where they just haven't gotten to them to implement the core solution yet. So I think we're in it for a while yet. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see us become simplistically the ATM of the world, you know, for these transactional systems that sit underneath all of the other important work that we need to do with this data and with this access. Yeah, exactly. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the business activity, because one of the things that I hear and my team hears a lot, you, you know, hospitals, hospital systems are acquiring hospitals. Um, even large medical groups are acquiring smaller medical groups. There's this constant churn of business activity. That's really making it hard. Here we have, as you mentioned, I mean, we have stressed out staffs to begin with, just for every reason we already know. Right. Um, and then there's this constant churn of business activity. Is that, 
how do we make things easier? I know that in real life, there's no actual easy button as in the commercials, but how do we make things at least less difficult? Because from what we're seeing, and, and, and I'll make this statement personally, what, from what I'm seeing, this business activity is going to continue for the foreseeable future. The, the, the health systems are growing larger and larger now. Yeah, I don't know if there is an easy answer to that, or there's certainly not an easy button. The, the, the harm in all of that activity is, as we're working toward interoperability, we keep orphaning records, we keep orphaning whole data sets of information that doesn't sync with the next system that it gets that that it goes to. There are um, several really nice companies out there that I've worked with that are doing legacy data um, and pulling legacy data into databases and then and then attempting to make it available in the EHRs. But to me, that's the real pain and angst of all of it is we can't get to interoperability and get to a point where we're not orphaning in all of this business M&A activity if we don't figure out how to make our data you know, more standard and, and how to store it in ways that people can get to it. You know, one of the things that has bothered me the most in the, in the four plus decades that I've been in this industry, all the way back to college, registering patients in the emergency room in a major or healthcare organization, matching a record when a patient comes in and they give you their name and their date of birth and, and whatever other demographic information you collect at the beginning, we still can't match an MPI in one organization, let alone across multiple organizations. So I, I'm not sure what the answer is. I hate to give a problem without a, a potential solution, but part of it for me and the, the portion of the industry that I serve is talent and expertise. And it's not just IT talent, it's, it's the talent we put on the front end in registration. It's the talent that we put on the back end of managing the data and the databases and, and everything in between. So um, I don't know what the answer is and that didn't help very much, but um, I think it's, it's something we've got to grapple with because when we just use the sound bites at the 40,000 foot level, we're not accomplishing anything. Right. Well, first of all, I agree with everything you've said. <laughs> and I also, I'll just tell, I'll share one story from my experience. You know, I've, I've, I've been fortunate to be in the industry as uh, almost as long as you and um, in, in my case as a journalist. And one of the things that I've done is I've been able to take a couple trips, a, a few trips abroad on business as well as, as for leisure. And um, I was in uh, Madrid and Barcelona in 2016, and I went to this amazing hospital that was fairly new at the time uh, in the suburbs of Madrid. And they gave me a wonderful tour and I met all their senior executives and people kept asking me, you really don't have a national patient identifier yeah. in the United yeah. States? And one gentleman asked it like three times, like he didn't believe it. Like, <laughs> and, and I think we're going to be struggling because of that no matter yeah. what. And so just to validate what you said, we, we had someone at one of our events um, <clears throat> a year and a half ago say, and they were from a health plan and they said, and they're based in Southern California. They said, he said, we have 300 Maria Garcias in our, in our database from one. Exactly. Plan. Yeah. So what do you think will be the biggest challenges of the next couple of years? And, and you can order them in any way that you wish. Well, I think I think most of the challenges that I would put forth are pretty equal. Um, you know, just adopting the technologies that come and being able to afford them um, are are pretty significant. We all know that talent is a huge issue with the Great Resignation, and and again, that's a sound bite, but but we feel it every day in every community that we serve, that there's just not enough resource and the resource that is there is not skilled enough or broad enough skilled to handle the diversity of the technologies. We've got, you know, in any given organization, I would estimate we've got at least 200 plus unique technologies and applications and modules of applications that we need talent to be able to understand and no shop, independent shop, except for the largest of them will ever be able to handle that. So I, you know, from my, from my quadrant of the, of the IT world, talent and staffing and that sort of thing is critical. Um, I don't need, I, 
I probably don't need to use a lot of time on AI, artificial intelligence. We talk about a lot that a lot, but the deployment is weak. Um, interoperability, as we just said a few minutes ago. Cyber defense. Um, what can you say about cyber defense? We it seems every day somebody that I never thought could be attacked is attacked. And and they've got the best of talent and the best of tools, and they're still attacked. And so I think we've got to figure out ways to get around that. Yeah. Do you, speaking of the great resignation, you know, a lot of us um, on a day-to-day -day level, we think of things like fast food restaurants, which are really <laughs> struggling tremendously now, but it is affecting health IT. Do you think, and, and most organizations don't have, I mean, no one has endless funds, right? Um, what is, maybe there is no answer, but what is the answer when you're a 300 bed community hospital and you need to move forward in so many areas, but you can't really afford to compete with others to get the top talent in IT. How, where do you make the cuts? Well, so as you are aware from, from the knowledge of some of my background, I've had a consulting practice in the traditional world for many, many years um, after leaving corporate healthcare IT and corporate hospitals and, and not-for-profit hospitals. And, and more recently, in the last several years, I've been a real student of the gig economy and um, feel that talent and expertise is, has got to become something that is um, accessed in multiple ways and not just in traditional ways. So, so part of every answer I will give you is that it doesn't just happen with IT. IT can't solve the problem. Organizations have to think differently about the way they do so many things in their operations. And HR and, and recruitment and retention, that has to change. We have to, we have, and, this, and again, this is a perspective that, that a number of people share in other industries is talent lives in a variety of places around the world. And now with the pandemic and the great resignation, people are reportedly and, and in fact, choosing to work where they wanna work, when they wanna work, how they want to work. So to think that you might touch any one of those 200 plus knowledge bases or not knowledge um, areas that are needed, by your local community in traditional hiring um, is, is foolhardy, I believe. And so, so beginning to look at what you need when you need it and accessing that through sources um, that are available through innovative technologies and innovative companies out there, I think is the answer to that. I, you certainly can't hire locally for all of those kinds of things. And I would suggest even the larger firms um, can't hire locally and that they have the larger healthcare delivery systems and they've recognized that they need to go get talent from other places. Yeah. So some of this will be remote and part-time or contract, right? Yep. And incremental and fractional and all of those other words that go with the gig economy. Um, if you need to adjust your CPOE order sets, for instance, I'm using just a very simple example, you probably don't keep a medication sentence writer, you know, analyst on your staff full time to do that occasional change that you need to make. And, and, and I think the other thing that's got to happen is from the user side of the equation, we can't anticipate that a, that a, a, an IT shop of whatever size that parallels the size of the organization can deliver on every request you would ever make of it without prioritization. And we're not good at that in healthcare. Yeah. Now that leads us into an area that is fascinating to me, and I want to try to frame this very carefully and precisely so that I, I don't um, misspeak. Um, more and more, it seems as though organizations will have to, patient care organizations will have to bring in people on a consultant basis, and that's fine, but how do CIOs, et cetera, make sure that they are getting their value for that because that is expensive. There's no, you know, you, you, you can't pay someone on a consulting basis what the, the equivalent of what they would make as a staffer. They're going to get more relative to, you know, if, if they're going to say, as you mentioned, uh, reworking order sets or something like that, um, and maybe it's a three-month contract, but they'll the individual will do well or their, their firm will do well. How do CIOs, et cetera, 
manage that and also manage expectations for the C-suite because they're going to be asking the questions? I think that that's a great question. And I think the, the leadership in IT needs to be more practitioner oriented. And I say that the meaning behind that for me is you have to know and understand more than just the high level um, attributes of whatever you're trying to accomplish. Otherwise, how do you select talent that can accomplish what needs to be done? And so I, I start with HR organizations and, and even an IT recruiter can't distinguish between one skill set or another in actuality when they're looking at a resource. Um, the, we haven't done a good job and it's been, a, it's been something that I have talked about forever in this industry is is the cost of the work we do. So we're not electricity in the wall in an IT organization. And yet, and yet most organizations think of it that way. They don't understand the cost um, of what they're asking. And, and if, they, if, if that were put forth, and if, that, if we managed it as a business and everything as a resource, then we would, I think we would make better decisions about the resources. And we'd find that a consultant for three months is far cheaper than an employee for a year. And that consultant for three months needs to deliver something that's measurable that the department that asked for it is accountable for. And we're not good at that accountability inside organizations most of the time. Yeah. And, and to be effective in this emerging world, uh, I think you'll agree the CIO has to work even smarter than they did before, right? They have Definitely. to really, yeah, they have to think really strategically. Like if, if what they need is going to involve five consultants on varying contracts, maybe three to six months, say, they're going to have to think very carefully about what kind of talent they're looking for. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the specifics, right? Like, we we need John for this amount of time. We need Jane for this amount of time. We need each of them to have this skill set. We need to have these expectations, and probably written into contracts, right? Uh, absolutely. And it, and to add on to what you just said, it takes a much different kind of leadership skill to organize around talent and expertise as opposed to organizing around positions. So, you know, my challenge to most organizations when I talk to them is the very next position that resigns, don't just go fill that position and post a job with yes. your HR department, look critically at how you need to spend those dollars um, in the organization to get accomplished what needs to be accomplished. You know, the other, the other problem that CIOs face relative to talent and reputation inside their own organizations is project lists that are endless that last forever because we try to treat that work like operational work as opposed to work that has a start and a stop and a budget and an accountability for outcomes. Yeah. And so we're really talking about far better project prioritization and IT governance, right? We are. And IT governance becomes a great big buzzword in every implementation with every vendor that I've ever engaged with in every facility. We start with IT governance and, and um, to be very casual about it, much lip service is given to that. Um, the meeting structures become rubber stamps to whatever anybody wants. Um, it becomes um, decision-making by committee consensus, which never happens. And, and so, it, so then we've got long, durations and budgets that are out of whack and things don't get delivered and IT is once again the 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 negative energy in an organization. Right. I I frequently say to people um, when I've held when I've worn the CIO hat in an in interim situations, I frequently say IT is not the issue here. Um, IT is not asking for this product to do this business in this area of the organization. The organization is asking for this. And so we need to make it happen. Even as I say that out loud, what I would also add to that is I don't believe that decentralizing IT to the departments is the right answer either because you need the controls and the discipline that an IT rigor puts around things. Um, but I think you definitely need people to step to the table and, and be accountable to their organizations. I can't tell you how many projects we've done through the years where you finish the project and the next several executive meetings, the executives who wanted that project don't have to report on the fact that people aren't actually using the system. 
you know, it just disappears. It just disappears. Mm -hmm. And so I think everyone needs to understand that there are scarce dollars and scarce resources, and you've got to be very critical in your assessment of what actually takes you forward in your organization. Yeah. And I think if I may, I'm going to touch on the leadership aspect because sure. most CIOs, most, not all, who, who came up to the ranks in IT as opposed to if they were a physician or a nurse who got propelled through clinical informatics, most IT, most CIOs coming out of the pure IT space moved up because of their technical competence. They were really good at what they did. Now, what we're talking about here is really leadership. And we're also talking about a level of understanding of human systems, human processes, right? That a, a lot of CIO, traditional CIOs aren't there in their, in their heads yet, right? So I remember having a conversation about three years ago with a CIO who said, you know, a huge percentage of CIOs aren't going to be here five years from now because the demands are so great um, and boards and uh, uh, C-suites and boards will say, well, you, you just didn't cut it. And it's not because, and he said, it's not because of technical competence. It's because of leadership and management skills. So it seems to me, and please share your thoughts on this. It seems to me as though we're going to have to help CIOs um, really take their game up to a much higher level as leaders and managers who can really think through these things that aren't really, I mean, there's a technical component because if you have a specific need, you under, need to understand what that need is and who can fill, fill it. But the, the level of leadership ability is going to really be, I think, emphasized. I, I agree with 99.9% .9 of what you just said. Um, you know, we started out in the on the technology side of things in organ in healthcare organizations. We started out with data processing managers, and it was just the big IBM equipment in the back room and keeping the lights on from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And there was very little software application that entered into the picture, and and even less industry regulation except for the regulation that came around billing and that sort of thing. And then. Then we moved into this era that we're in now where there's regulation around everything that we do clinically and how we report and what we do and then all kinds of other requirements and expectations. And so it, it you know, I, I also study this a lot and I have lots of opinions about <laughs> that some may not be too popular about about CIOs and talking about being a member of the C-suite and being that executive. And, and generally bemoaning the fact that their role is not in that echelon at this time. And, there, and, and that's not to say, I mean, I know many stellar, stellar, stellar executives at that level that, that, that work at that level. But as, an, as a profession, as a whole, we still lack that understanding of those things. And we still run back to our projects list and our our staffing in a traditional way, and then the widgets and the gadgets and things. And, um, you know, I, I, I hearken back to a, a book now that's probably dated 25 years or so. It was just a quick guide to executives on IT. And I have this dream of writing a new book for executives um, so that everybody can understand the new world that we live in. It's not just that bits and bytes any longer. One more thought I would share with you I think that the understanding of the business operations from front to back, you know, how does data move across an organization, but meaning how does the human that's seeking services in your organization move? What needs to connect? What needs to talk? How do you get that information um, to, to be solid and, and available and all of that? That understanding needs to be there. You know, one of the things that, that has set us apart in our consulting practice through the years, and, and I came to it honestly with my hospital background first, is that, that my staff, my consultants who go into an organization know the workflow. They don't know just the physician places an order, they know where that order goes next and who has to approve that order and what the GL code is attached to that medication and how we get charged for that. And so, so a medication management process as opposed to 
one segment of it. And so our industry at large needs to understand that better so that we can so we can have less costly resources and fewer resources doing more work because they understand the process and the workflow and not just the technical elements on any given topic. Exactly. And I, I think that also speaks to, again, you know, I look at the, the emergence of the CIO role in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And I, I sometimes joke what, what happened was that in a thousand hospitals, someone took Joe from the basement and said, you're the CIO. And Joe said, oh, that's great. What, what, what's the CIO? And so we started out with people, with individuals who were very technically competent, but they, in some cases, they had no real management um, preparation for, for the role. And then we kept moving things up and up. And now, I think one of the key things that you've 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 been kind of circling around, and I think I'll just name it, is that the, you know the CIO now really needs to be an individual who can effectively sit at the table in a C-suite meeting and not, as you said, not talk about widgets and bits and bytes. Talk about uh, say, you know, to say to the people around the table, the CEO, the CFO, the COO, etc., the CMO, CNO, say okay, I am hearing you're saying we need blah, blah, blah. I will now translate back to you what I think that means. But if the CIO cannot her or himself be that kind of person who speaks the, both languages, who speaks the language of the C-suite and of the core business objectives of the organization, they'll still they'll remain relegated to being the tech guy or the tech gal, right? And, and the order taker. The order taker. The order taker. Um, and so, and, but it's a two way street. Um, the C suite members need to be able to think of that CIO as a member of their team and not as an obstructionist yeah. or someone who doesn't get things done or someone that just takes up all the budget and sucks all the oxygen out of the room with, with the projects. Um, I think there's, there's a balance of, of perspectives that need to be had. And, and it's, it's somewhat equal on both sides. Um, if, if the CEO and the COO um, don't respect the CIO position, um, then, then changes need to occur, of course, it, whether it be with the role or with the person or with them. But you know, what I'm seeing a lot of is a splintering of, of functionality. So, so the CTO now can report independently of the CIO or the chief data officer can report or the chief digital transformation officer. I mean, those are all, to me, those are all functions that should live under yeah. an executive CIO role. If you've got an information officer, if you've got a technology officer, um, they shouldn't be, because those roles don't, most of the time don't elevate. Um, and, the, and then we, you know, you, you spoke about it being a technologist or somebody that had a practitioner's background becoming that CIO. It's equally true that, that you can't just take a physician or a nurse and turn them into a CIO or to a chief um, digital officer or chief you know, officer of whatever kind without some knowledge of, of the operations and how technology works. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. There, there are several things there I'll, I'll respond to if I may. I mean, yes, first of all, we're seeing... Um, the chief digital officer position and the chief data officer position emerge. And there's this huge debate. It's like a, it's like a, a category five hurricane uh, on where they should report to. And, 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 and I agree with you. I think in an ideal world, they should report up to someone who is in effect the CIO, because that person really will understand where all the data and all the digital development should go. The, the, I think the other complication here in many organizations now, the CMIO, it has become as important as the CIO. And there's a reason for that, of course, because at the core, what we need to do right now is clinical transformation. And the, the one of the key people who can help besides the CMO and the CNO to, to uh, lead that will be the CMIO because that person understands how you will use the technology, for example, um, to uh, facilitate the data analytics that will help change core 
uh, mm -hmm. delivery processes, right? So do you think that um, organizations will get it together in terms of making all of these positions and roles work together well so that they, they really can deliver what needs to be delivered? Um, <laughs> I'm a glass half full most of the time, but I am jaded in my perspective, having watched us make a lot of mistakes through the mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. in the industry. Um, I, I think splintering roles, and I think that the reason that happens is because we're filling a vacuum. We're, we're, we're creating something to do something that we think we're missing, and that in actuality, we probably are missing. So, so I've seen some really brilliant partnerships in large organizations between a CIO and a CMIO and a CNIO. I've seen some really great collaboration. But again, what is the, what is the prerequisite training for a CMIO? That you are a medical doctor and you understand workflow. But the interesting thing, a lot of CMIOs come from a discipline that is not a pervasive discipline to the organization from a um, livelihood perspective, from a, from a uh, revenue perspective. So if you have a, a, someone who's interested in information technology and they are a, and, and I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't want to name a certain, any certain discipline of physician, but if they are not representative of your primary business mm -hmm. and your primary revenue sources, then they're not going to be successful with those physicians. It's a very interesting thing. There's certainly a great respect in the profession among disciplines, but when it comes to, you don't really understand what I need to do in the system every day, that changes. And so, so I think we've got a, we've, we're not, we're still very embryonic in that in that world and not very sophisticated. And we keep creating positions to fill gaps. And to some degree, we create it because a consulting firm might have told us that we should, or we feel a need to be in the mainstream with media and with messaging that's out there. And, and what really are we trying to accomplish? Right. Um, you know, if we're Right. And also, as we all know, the, the original CMIOs were people were calling them propeller head docs. You know, they were yeah. they, they were docs who like technology and they they were enlisted to help choose the EHR, which we understand right. the history of that. But we need both as the CIO position evolves forward, the CMIO position is evolving forward into a true leadership position too. And clearly it can't just be a doc who likes technology. There has to be yeah. a lot more. Um, let's let's conclude um, on a, an, an up note, but in a good way. Uh, give us your key pieces of advice, Becky, for the next few years. What, what should leaders of patient care organizations be doing, thinking and doing right now? Well, I think, um, you know, speaking in somewhat general terms, they should certainly be looking at how they're delivering their IT and how they're prioritizing things. And, you know, the, the age old discussion about a strategic plan and the IT strategy being married to a business plan for the organization. Um, I, I we are all moving so fast and there have been so many complications in the last few years that right now people are in survival mode um, across the organizations. They're doing everything in their power to re-engage the patient, to re-engage the physicians in their communities and to stay alive and, and then to seek talent to be able to deliver against nursing shortages and that sort of thing. So um, what can they do? I mean, I think they, they, I think most people need to step back and take a really good look at what business they need to be in and what areas of the business they really need to invest in and, and have an unrelenting focus to that. There is a bit of a tendency in some of the organizations I've seen lately to be jumping at whatever new shiny thing. And I know this is an innovative innovation series um, and I love innovation, but we can't try everything. And some things have to have some proof statement behind them. And if we don't, as businesses, any of us as a business owner or, or a leader in a business, if we're not focused um, on what our outcomes need to be and what our goal and target is, then there's no way that we're going to make it. So if I speak specifically to IT, I am I'm getting more and more in the, in the frame of mind that it's too complex for most organizations aside from the largest of organizations in our industry, it's too complex to take everything on internally. 
I, I don't believe that we should have data centers internally. I don't believe that we should have our, our SOC, our security cyber defense internal, that if, if you can go to an organization that is 100% focused on those things for you, then that's better than the one or two people that you could hire to try to keep up with what the bad guys are trying to do to you in cyber, in cyber for instance. So I, I think that we should shed those things that can be shed to experts in the industry that have proven statements of, of outcome and focus on what we need to do internally. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it's not only healthcare, but other industries that are starting to real, realize that also. So Certainly, certainly. Well, thank you so much, Becky. This has been such a fabulous conversation. Yeah. I've learned a lot. I know, I know our audience has. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your insights. Absolutely. Great to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone in our audience. This concludes this session. Have a great day. Bye-bye.